It is two o'clock Central Standard Time, 524-2021. And we want to say welcome to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Marcellus, Padrano, Con, Truett, and Seagullville North, all of the Dallas Independent School District. Thank you so much for joining us today. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please go to www.towny.cc slash EDC register and sign the register form. Please, that's just for our attendance. The program today will be life cycles. During this virtual field trip, students will compare ways that young animals resemble their parents and observe and record life cycles of animals. Uh, Mr. Monroe will present the life cycle of a quail. Ms. Nash, the life cycle of a snake. The life cycle of a fish will be presented by Ms. Fuller. And Ms. Ramirez will do the life cycle of a rabbit. Uh, you cannot verbally ask us a question, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question, space answer, and send in your question, and we'll be glad to answer it for you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mr. Monroe is going to tell you Hello everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be looking at the life cycle of a certain species of quail. Now, when we talk about quail, we're talking about a small bird that basically they nest on the ground. And until recently, I was not aware that there was such a variety of different species. Where I was born and raised in Northwestern Oklahoma, there was only one species of quail that I was familiar with, and that was the Bob White quail. Uh, here lately, I found out that there are feral quail, blue quail, and the most recent that I found out about was a little quail called a Coternix. Now that Coternix quail is not native to North America. It's actually a native of Asia. Now, a lot of people are raising this particular species of quail, and I won't get into the reason why they're raising them, but for one reason, they are very fast in maturity. Uh, doesn't take long to hatch, doesn't take long for them to reach adulthood. So what we're going to be looking at are the different stages that exist in the life cycle of a Coternix quail. Now, students, I've got a little video that I wanna show you. So at this point, I'm going to share my screen with you guys and hopefully this video will work. And let's see here. Oh, that's the very end of it. That's not what I want there. Here we go. We do you want to see all of them? And these guys are really small. This is about a day after they were born. And you can see they're very mobile. They get around pretty good. All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing the screen right here. And, uh, you know, it takes about 17 days for these carternic quail to hatch. And of course, those two youngsters that you saw in the video, the quick video, they, uh, they are quite grown now, or they're a little bit bigger now. But right after they came out of the shell, that 17th day after they came out of the shell, after they dried out, it was amazing how active they became. In fact, the stages in the life cycle of a Coternix quail go something like this. The first 10 days, 
we call them hatchlings. Another name for them, they are called buttons. I guess because what you saw, they're as cute as buttons. Now during that first 10 days, because there's no mom, there's no nest for them to get under their mom to stay warm, there has to be a heat source and a light source, okay? Now on the 11th day, that's when they move into the next stage in their life cycle. That 11th day is the beginning of what we call the toddler age. And of course, you guys have all heard uh, your parents talk about toddlers, right? Well, toddlers in human years would be somewhere around the year uh, two years old to three years old, right? And then on the 22nd day in their life cycle, they become what we call teenagers, young adults, okay? Now that period of time that they're existing as teenagers or young adults can last up to 56 years, day, 56 days old. At that, at that end of that period, they then become mature adults. And somewhere between the 22nd day and the 56th day, they may start laying eggs. Now, once they pass the 56th day, from then on, they are considered to be adults. Now, the golden years, and I guess you would, hmm, golden years, probably senior citizen years, would be somewhere between one year to two years old. That's when they start slowing down. Now, I have some live specimens that I wanna show you guys. And I'm gonna start by showing the type of egg that those two youngins that you saw came out of. This is a Caternix egg. Now, this one, we're not sure whether it's fertile or not, and they have to be fertile for them to hatch out of. But I do have one that one of those youngsters that you observed in the video came out of. And that, he pecked his way out of that egg around the, the top of it, and he exited the egg. Now that's amazing because as I look at this egg, the shell of this egg is awful thick. So that little fella had to really work. And it's amazing, you heard me talk about how agile, how they were moving around. And what you were looking at in the video is that after they dried off and got some of the wetness off of them, that's when they became very active. They started flapping their wings, they started feeding, they started scooting and running around inside that box. And you know what guys? A two-week-year-old, a two-week-old chicken is not that agile. So they are very aggressive, but they are very fast growing once they hatch out of the egg. Now, there are some things I want you to think about while we go further into this presentation. And that is, and I've already answered that, what do we call a baby quail? It's kind of like a riddle because they're cute as a what? a button. So they are called buttons or hatchlings. And you know what? You might question yourself, why do they look like their parents? Well, that has a lot to do with what we call heredity. You know, uh, it's really something different because this particular species or kind of quail, they have a wide range of colors. They can be dark brown, they can be scaled in, in, a, in design of their feathers, they can be caramel or they can be all white. So a lot of that color will come from maybe even the parents or the grandparents, okay? Now, what I'm going to do for you now is to, I've showed you the A and I do have a couple of buttons over here that I'm gonna get one of them out. I want you guys to look at it, okay? Come here, little button. Hold still, whoa, boy, they are quick. One thing about quail, they are considered to be ground birds. Now this is a button. And we can look at this little button. Oh, she's ready to go. And I hear her partner calling for her with that little burp, I, perp. Uh, I don't know whether you guys can hear it or not, but I'm gonna put her up. I do believe this is a female. It's hard to tell at this age. Remember what we call, this is a button. And this one is under. 10 days old, put her back, 
think that's a T, and I'm going to get a teenager out. Now, this is one of the ones that you did observe in the video. It's gotten bigger in a hurry. And already, this one can fly. Now, a lot of times, they don't like to fly. These guys are very good runners. This is a teenager. Won't be long before this one, I'm feeling like it is a female because it doesn't have spots on its chest. It won't be long before this one will start laying eggs. Remember what I said, they are fast growing. And that's a teenager. I have one other stage represented here. This it out. Because let me tell you what, they can fly and they can fly very fast. And if I can't grab this one right, I may be chasing this one all around the building here. Here we go. Whoa. Yeah, she almost got away. There she is. That's a true female. Now they do say that the female, you can tell the female if it's got spots in the breast area. So this is a female Coturnix quail. Yeah, pretty good size. This is about as big as this quail will get. I'm gonna put it up before it gets away. So actually, there are five stages in the life cycle of a Coturnix quail. It's the button quail, and then it's a toddler, and then it's a teenager, and then it's a young adult, then it's the adult, and then the golden age, which is considered to be that adult stage. Now, if any of you have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman, and maybe he can answer those questions for you. You guys have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, question asks, how long does a quail live in the wild? Uh, I'll read this little for you. Uh, quail cannot endure long flights. They usually live their entire lives within a 40 acre radius. If startled, these birds explode into a short rapid flight called flushing. Quails have a lifespan of two to three years. So they only live two to three years in the wild. And now Miss Nash is gonna tell you about snakes. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're gonna to be talking about snakes and their other reptile cousins. So let me get that out. And escape, they are escape artists. You have to be careful. They can't fly like those quail, but they can sure wiggle away. This is red and red is my corn snake, red rat snake. And they're a very beautiful snake, a very gentle kind, which a constrictor. We wouldn't have any venomous animals here. Nothing really dangerous. And Red was raised in captivity. Someone had his mother, his mama, and she laid a bunch of eggs. And out of one of those eggs hatched Red. And he had that mama didn't take any care of him. Mama didn't teach him what to do, but he knew what to do. He knew how to find prey by using that tongue to smell. He knew how to kill prey by racking around with those strong coils. And he knew how to eat okay, and find water and find shelter. So they're kind of born knowing what they need to, to do. Okay. But this kind of snake hatched from an egg. And he's an adult now. He won't get much bigger than this. And we think it's a boy. We're not sure. Oh, he's determined today. <laughs> get out before I put that lid on. Okay, I'm going to keep an eye on him. He wants to go out when he's looking for a girlfriend today. So, Let's talk about some other kinds of reptiles and, and other kinds of snakes, because not all snakes lay eggs. Not all snakes hatch out of eggs. I'm going to share my screen, and we'll talk about snakes and other reptiles. So the reptiles, of course, are scaly, have scales on their bodily. 
and we're on the most ancient of reptiles, and one that we've all seen in their reproductive life are the turtles, the sea turtles. We've all seen those pictures of mama sea turtle dragging herself up on the beach out of the ocean. They spend their whole life in the ocean, but they have to come back to land to lay eggs because they're reptiles, so eggs have to be laid on land. So mama sea turtle drags herself up to beat the nest, lays hundreds of eggs, and then she goes back to the ocean. The eggs are on their own, the babies are on their own. They hatch out and they have to run as fast as they can to the safety of the ocean. Okay. And mama will lay hundreds of eggs, thousands in her lifetime, perhaps. And of those thousands of, of eggs, maybe a few will survive. That's one way to, to have a, a strategy. Here's a different kind of reptile, the alligator. Interestingly enough, they're one of the few reptiles that really take care of their young. So mom alligator builds a big nest out of uh, grass and sticks and things. She lays her eggs inside, she covers it up and she's guarding that nest. Don't go near the alligator nest, mama is there. When the babies hatch, they look just like little alligators and mama will actually carry them around. She carries them in her giant cheeky mouth to a safe place to swim and, and eat and she's protecting them until they get a little bit bigger. She doesn't actually feed them, but she protects them. Okay. Now, as I said, here's a rat snake like red and they do lay eggs. And those eggs are different than the quail eggs you saw. They're kind of leathery. They're not, they're not brittle like a chicken egg. But the baby snake pushes its way out okay, of that egg and they look just like a little baby rat snake when they come out and they do vary in color. Some are more brown, some are more red. But some snakes, interestingly enough, don't lay eggs, okay? including our famous rattlesnake. So here's a mama and a papa rattlesnake, and mama will, after a few months, will go find a safe place to hide under a rock or a little burrow there, and she will have a bunch of baby snakes. She didn't lay eggs, the babies were born alive. And she will stay with those babies, she's guarding them. She doesn't actually feed them, but she stays with them for a week or so until they're a little bit bigger, and then they will crawl off on their own. So it's really interesting, some snakes and some lizards um, have live birth. Here's some lizards, okay. They also lay those leathery eggs, okay. Mama skink takes good care of her eggs, okay. She doesn't just lay them and go away like the turtle did. She lays them and she stays with them and she keeps them moist. She goes out and warms up her body in the sun and then comes back and warms the eggs up. So really interesting behavior, things they do that I didn't even know about that. Other kinds of lizards have live births like this one. So she only had a few babies, okay. So laying a whole bunch of eggs, she had a few babies. Okay. But they probably got a better start. They look safer being inside mama for longer, okay. Because they're pretty tiny when they're born, okay. And lots of different animals could eat them. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and let's think a little bit more about, about other reptiles like the turtle. So when baby turtle hatches out of the egg, mama turtle is long gone. So baby turtle has to just take care of itself. So the turtles of course have an advantage. They have that shell on them that can help protect them. Okay? And this kind of turtle that you might find around can live for a hundred years, believe it or not. Unbelievable. Turtles live a long, long time. Like that sea turtle can live 50 years or more. The giant Galapagos turtles can live almost 200 years. Okay. They don't make a great pet, but you don't want to have a pet that's a little longer than you will. So if you find one in the wild, enjoy looking at it, observe it, and leave it there. It's a wild animal. But they are really interesting. They just kind of get bigger and bigger. They look like the same animal, only bigger as they grow. So lots of interesting things to find out about reptiles, okay, 
And I learned some new things myself doing the research for this program. I didn't know that about the skin. It was so interesting. So if you have any more questions about reptiles, Dr. Brummer will be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. Uh, there was a question. Does the EEC have any venomous snakes? Uh, not on display for the students, not in the reptile room. We used to have a copperhead and a diamondback rattlesnake, but that was a long time ago, and we decided not to have any more venomous snakes. All of our snakes are considered constrictors. Uh, however, across the street in the uh, Post Oak Preserve, we have observed a few copperheads, not many, and they're very secretive. They try to stay away from people. Uh, so uh, we do have a few in the wild. And now Ms. Fuller is going to tell you all about the life cycle of a fish. Whoops. Good afternoon, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Fuller. And here at the Environmental Center, we have some fish. Now, your teacher can order these fish from the Living Materials Center. These are guppies. That's a very common fish to be found in primary classrooms and in libraries. And this guppy, there's several in there actually, they have live birth. They don't lay eggs, they have live birth. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? That would be nice to see a fish give live birth in the classroom. Well, we're gonna be talking about the life cycle of fish. Not all fish have the same kind of life cycle. Let me share my screen with you and I'm gonna show you which fish have live babies like mollies and like guppies and which, which ones have lay eggs. So life cycles of fish, how do fish live their lives? So here are some essential questions to keep in mind as we go through our presentation. Number one, how do fish breathe? You know they stay in the water all the time. So they, they're breathing water. Well, what's in the water that allows them to stay alive? Because they don't have lungs like we do. Number two, are all fish born from eggs? Look at those cute little fish all rolled up inside those eggs. They almost look like eyeballs, don't they? Now, this is the life cycle of a very specific fish, a Pacific salmon, oh, excuse me, an Atlantic salmon. And uh, it starts over here on the right-hand side, that little ball is the egg. And when the mother salmon lays the egg, she lays it in fresh water in a riverbed and the egg goes into the gravel and lays there until she lays the egg in the fall and it, it hatches out in the, uh, in the spring and it forms this little guy right here. And he's got the uh, yolk sac attached to him. So he has nutrition. This little uh, stage right here is called a fry and he doesn't look very much like his parents yet. And then about three to six weeks after they hatch, they form some, uh, they form the fry. This one's called the alvin. This one, it looks like he has wings. That's the alvin. The one below him is the fry. And he's looking more fishy than he did before. When the fry gets old enough, he becomes, he becomes a par, P-A-R-R. -R. And they can be about two inches long and they stay there in the fresh water in the river for about two or three years. Now, when they get big enough, they swim to the Atlantic Ocean. This stage is called the smolts. And when the smolts get to the, uh, they're about six inches long right here. And, and then they uh, become an adult or a young adult. And then after that, they become the big adult. Now they live in the ocean for several years. And then when the mother is ready, she swims upstream uh, in the river that she came from when she was a little, little par. And she lays her eggs right over the gravel and the eggs go in the gravel and it starts over again. That's why they call it a cycle. 
because she this is this is what's repeated over and over again. All right, and you might be familiar with salmon. You might eat salmon patties at home, or maybe a salmon steak. Maybe your parents grill salmon steak on the barbecue grill. Now, how are baby fish born? Some fish lay eggs, and like we just saw with the salmon, and the babies hatch from the egg, and the fish that lay eggs, common fish that lay eggs are salmon, and catfish, and groupers, and tarpon. You may know tarpon if you've ever been down to the Gulf Coast here in Texas. Now, some fish have live birth, and the common examples of fish that have live birth are guppies and mollies and mosquito fish, uh, gambusia. When you come here to the environmental center next year on a field trip, maybe you can see some mosquito fish, some gambusia. Now, not all sharks have live birth. About 70% have live birth. About 30% of sharks lay eggs. And uh, these are three different shark egg packets. And uh, this one over here, it's very easy, it's backlit. So it's very easy to see the baby shark in there in that egg. And there's the yolk right there that provides the nutrients for the baby. And here it is when it's not lit from the back, it kind of looks like a tatting shuttle. And then over here is another one that's lit up so you can see what the baby shark looks like inside. Now, what do we call fish eggs? Some fish lay eggs that are called roe that people like to eat. Sometimes it's called caviar. So over on the right, do you see that? It looks like, a, like maybe jam on these toast points. That's called caviar. This is the expensive one. It's black. It's from a beluga, maybe a sturgeon, or uh, there's an Iranian fish uh, that's got the most expensive caviar, and it's black. The, the row over here on the left-hand side with the lemon slice on it, that's from salmon. It's bright red. It actually can range. It doesn't have to be bright red. It can be orange. It can be yellow. It, it can range in size. It's, it doesn't taste sweet, even though it looks like we've got it on there like jam. It doesn't taste sweet. It's very salty. Okay, now how do fish breathe? They breathe with gills. Now they have these gills on the side of their face. They're like little filaments and it filters out the dissolved oxygen that's in the, in the water. They don't have lungs like we do. Now here's a challenge for you. Find a fish. You can find a live fish in your classroom or in the library or in the science lab. You can find a picture of a fish in a book or even on the computer. See if you can draw that fish, color it, and give it to your teachers. Make sure you write the name of the fish on your drawing. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. If you have any fish questions, he'll be more than happy to answer those for you. Thank you, have a delightful week. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. And in Texas, a lot of people fish for a fish called a bass, a big mouth bass. And the question came in, what's the biggest bass ever caught in Texas? Uh, the biggest largemouth bass ever caught in Texas weighed 18 and one fifth pounds and measured 25 and a half inches long. Uh, that is a pretty big fish. I don't think I've ever caught one that big. Now, Ms. Ramirez is gonna tell us about the life cycle of her rabbit and others. Hello, my name is Miss Ramirez and in this segment we're going to be learning about the life cycle of a rabbit. So before we get started with our presentation, I actually have my pet rabbit to show you guys. Her name is Mochi. It might take me a few seconds uh, to get her pulled out of her cage. Uh, so while you guys are waiting to meet Mochi the rabbit, if you want to show me uh, some bunny ears like this and then you can actually stand up, you can push your chair in and you can give five bunny hops by your chair while I try and go get Mochi the rabbit out. So go ahead and do your bunny hops and I'll be right back with our bunny Mochi. Okay, 
So hopefully you guys were able to get some of those bunny hops in. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. And as soon as you guys are in your seats, I will go ahead and introduce you guys to my bunny rabbit, Mochi. So here is Mochi and she is a rabbit. And uh, she is a type of animal called a mammal. So mammals have hair or fur. So we have hair on our bodies. We are a mammal, just like Mochi here. So here's a close up of Mochi. Notice what she's doing with her nose, how it's moving. And then look at those long whiskers and those big eyes. She has an interesting face because half her face has brown fur and the other half of her face has black fur. And then notice these big ears she has. So what do you think she uses those big ears for or that big nose for or those big eyes for? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put our bunny Mochi up and uh, you guys can say bye Mochi. And we're gonna learn about her life cycle. So how she changes as she grows. I'm actually gonna let her go down on the floor because I'm actually done with her today and I'm sure she would like to go play. So let me just let her out and she can go play while I'm doing the presentation. Uh, so hopefully you guys were able to notice that Mochi was moving her nose to help her smell. So here is a, a model of a skeleton, the skull of a rabbit. So look at those long teeth they have. Look at those big eye sockets too. The teeth of a rabbit are constantly growing and that is why they always chew on things. So if you have a rabbit as a pet, uh, you better be prepared for them to chew on just about everything. And then something cool is a, this is a model of a brain of a rabbit. And it looks kind of weird. This weird little bulb that you see at the end is called the olfactory bulb. It's a big word. All it means is it's just where they, it's a part of the brain that helps them smell. So remember Mochi was moving her nose a lot. She has a really good sense of smell. Um, even so, her smell is so good. I had a bowl of fruits and vegetables here for one lesson and she was able, without even seeing the fruits and veggies, she knew I had them. She could smell them up here on the table. So there's an example, a model of what the brain of a rabbit looks like. So they have a big smell organ. And then the last little thing before we start our presentation is just a quick little poem about a rabbit. And uh, we're gonna act it out with our hands. So if you do like this, kind of like a peace sign. Uh, so this looks like a rabbit and we're gonna learn a little poem called, I saw a little rabbit. So everyone should have their little rabbit hands up and it goes, I saw a little rabbit go hop, hop, hop. I saw a little rabbit go hop, hop, hop. I saw a little rabbit with her ears go flop, flop, flop. I saw a little rabbit with her little eyes go blink, blink, blink. I saw a little rabbit with her nose go twink, twink, twink. So think about those motions for our rabbit friend. Do you guys remember how long her ears were? Do you guys remember uh, how her nose was moving to help her smell? And do you guys remember her nice big eyes that help her see? And those are very important body parts because rabbits are actually good food for a lot of animals. So we have animals out here like coyotes and bobcats that would probably love to eat a rabbit for food. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll take a look at um, some other rabbits and explore how they change as they grow up. So I have a couple of questions for you. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, what is a baby rabbit called? The second is, how is a baby rabbit the same or similar to its mom and how is it different? And hopefully you guys were able to see a couple of these cute little pictures of some rabbits. They come in all sorts of colors, all different sizes, and all different kinds of fur or hair. So in our next slide, we're going to watch a little video to see how a rabbit changes as it grows. As you watch the video, think about how does the baby rabbit look like its parents and how is it different? The name for a baby rabbit is a kit. 
So when I say kit, I'm not talking about a baby cat or kitten. I'm talking about a baby rabbit. So again, the name for a baby rabbit is a kit, K-I-T. So you'll see here, the mommy rabbit has made a nest using her own fur. She just takes a couple of uh, pieces of her fur out to make that soft nest. And look at the little babies inside. Those babies are only one year old and they're kind of pink in color. They don't really have their fur yet. And notice their eyes aren't even open yet. So because they're so young, their mom has to take really good care of them. As the days go on, you'll notice that they start to grow more fur or hair on their bodies. Their ears start to get longer their legs start to get stronger and they're able to move around a lot more. Also notice their little eyes are starting to open and they're being more active. They're moving around a lot. And as the days go by, they're gonna start to look more like a typical rabbit that we would think of. We can see their ears and their legs and their little tails. They look so cute when they're little. Now, I don't know what Mochi looked like when she was a baby because I, by the time I got her, she was already a full grown adult. Uh, but think about Mochi was brown and black. Think about what do you think her parents might have looked like? And then as the weeks go on, we're about two weeks. You can see those cute little rabbits have grown. They've gotten a lot bigger. They're more active. They move around a lot. You can clearly see those big ears and those big feet to help them run and jump. They're starting to look more like an adult. And you can see, I'm gonna guess that that's the mommy rabbit. Uh, so you can see she has kind of like white and gray fur. So her babies sort of look like her. We see some white rabbits there and we also see some of those little rabbits that have white and gray on them too. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fast forward it just a little bit so you can see them. Um, when they grow up, they look so cute. And there they are again. So again, look at those big ears and those, that nose just constantly moving. I'm gonna stop it there. And here's just a recap. So here's what the baby looked when it was a newborn, when it was just born. So notice there's not a lot of fur, the eyes are closed and it doesn't really move a lot. As it gets older, it starts to get more fur growing. Uh, the ears get longer, the feet get bigger. It starts to get more fur. As it gets older, a few weeks into its life, it starts to move around a lot more. Its eyes start to open. And eventually it starts to look like an adolescent or a, a young adult rabbit. Now, as we know, Mochi is an adult already. I unfortunately missed her baby years. Now here are some wild rabbits. Uh, these wild rabbits were found outside. Uh, they were found on a farm. Um, their home was kind of destroyed by accident by a tractor. And unfortunately, these two were the only one that survived. And since they didn't have their mommy with them anymore, uh, we ended up taking them in. But you can see when they were a baby, look how tiny they were. Can you imagine having two little baby rabbits fitting inside your hand? Uh, so they were really small and cute. Um, and then you can see over the course of a few months, they grew up really big and they became an adult. Uh, so you can compare what these rabbits look like when they were a baby versus when they were adult. Now these are cottontail rabbits. This breed again is a wild rabbit. They are not pets. These are the kinds of rabbits that you guys would probably find um, like in a forest or in our case, a farm. But something that I learned from these rabbits is that the babies, when they're young, they kind of have a white patch, a little dot in the center of their forehead. And then as they get older, uh, that fur, the spot kind of disappears and it's covered again by the brown fur. So you can see on this one, this little guy, he has that little white spot on his forehead. And then as they got older, that little spot disappears. So those are wild rabbits. And then here's a quick little video of those same wild rabbits when they were a little bit older. This was probably one of the last videos I took of them before we released them and took them back outside. Uh, the little rabbit that you see over here in the corner that's missing a part of his ear, that we named Patches. And the other rabbit was Bunny Foo Foo. Now this is their surrogate mom. So this is not their real mom. This is my rabbit, Bella. And she was a good protector for them. She uh, kind of acted like a step-in mom since they didn't have their mom with them. And she took really good care of them. 
This is when we release them back outside into the wild. Again, these are not pet rabbits. They were very skittish. They were afraid of people and they really didn't like us touching them. Um, so as soon as they were old enough, we went ahead and released them back out the farm. And every now and then when we go back out there and we see a rabbit, we always think, oh, it might be Patches or Bunny Foo Foo. Uh, so those are wild rabbits. Notice how they look different than my pet rabbit Mochi. So those wild rabbits have much longer legs. They also have a more skinnier, slender body. Um, those ears are a lot bigger. They're more alert. Now, wild rabbits are not good pets, as I said before, and they should be left outside in the wild. So we should leave them alone. On the other hand, pet rabbits make good pets. Those are like the ones you find at the pet store, but they do not survive in the wild. So if you get a pet rabbit and you decide you don't want it anymore, you should give it to somebody else. So you don't want to just leave it outside because it's probably not going to survive. It doesn't, it's not going to know really what to do. Uh, so look at some pictures of some wild rabbits and compare these wild rabbits to our pet or domestic rabbits that you see on this side. So hopefully you guys are able to notice some differences, but also some similarities between a wild rabbit and a pet rabbit. The first thing I notice is the wild rabbits are all sort of what color? They're all kind of like a brown color so they can hide or camouflage. Our pet rabbits can come in all sorts of weird colors and patterns. Some might be stripes or have spots. They have different kinds of hair. Um, so pet rabbits can look a lot different than our wild rabbit. And then I have a quick challenge question for you. It's a reflection question. So we learned today about all the different life cycles of different animals. Think about the life cycle that you as a human goes through. Uh, so think about how do you look like your parents or your relatives and think about how has your appearance changed as you've grown up. So something fun you can do is to bring maybe a picture of yourself when you were a baby and compare it uh, to your classmates and what they look like. And then here's just a quick few pictures. I have a twin brother. So there's my brother, um, Matt. And compare how we looked as kids to the way we look now. Um, so that's something interesting that you guys can do is compare your own to your own family members and how you look now that you're in first grade. And then compare how you resemble or look like your parents or other family members. So a lot of people say that I look like my mother. Um, oftentimes we get asked if we are sisters, but we're not. She's my mom. She's a lot older than I am. Uh, so she always gets a laugh out of that because it makes her feel young, but then it makes me feel old. Uh, so there's our family there. So I'm going to go ahead and stop our screen share and we're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions uh, about rabbits. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And uh, I have a statement about rabbits. Uh, I live uh, kind of in the far in the country uh, in Waxahachie, and there's two big fields, one across the street from me, one on the right of me. And so there's lots of rabbits out there. And apparently they love the Asian jasmine uh, that's in uh, front of my house. And as, uh, as we start to leave in the afternoons, a lot of times, there'll be two or three rabbits in there eating. Now, one of them, a large cottontail, she's got to the point to where she doesn't even run off when we walk out. As long as we stay four or five feet away from her on the curb and uh, don't, we, we don't try to make a pet or anything, she'll continue to eat, but she always turns her body where her head's always watching us so she can make sure that we don't do anything we're not supposed to. But she's been there now for quite some time, and so I guess she, I guess we kind of coexist there. But now the question is, how many baby rabbits does a female rabbit have at a time? Each litter can contain between one and 12 rabbits. I tried to count them one day old rabbits a while ago, but they were moving so fast and twisting around and all I never did count. I think I might've counted nine, but I'm not sure. And, and a female rabbit can get pregnant again almost immediately after she gives birth. So there's a lots of rabbits happening around. Uh, we're now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students compared ways that young rabbits resemble their parents and observed and recorded life cycles of animals. 
And yes, we think that Ms. Ramirez does look like her mother. Uh, Mr. Monroe covered the life cycle of a quail. Ms. Ma Nash covered the life cycle of a snake. The life cycle of a fish was presented by Ms. Fuller. And Ms. Ramirez did the life cycle of a rabbit. Thank you. How did we do, teachers? If you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a short form, and send it to us. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you have a good day. And more importantly, I hope you have a great life. Thank you again.